Welcome everyone to this second presentation covering chapter 13 of the Blossom Anatomy of the Nervous System. In the previous discussion, we looked at a little bit of embryology, but mostly the structures of the brain and spinal cord. In this presentation, we'll be focusing on 13.3 and 13.4. These two sections of the Blossom are going to cover um, circulation, the blood flow to the brain. We're also going to be looking at the meninges, uh, the connective tissue layers that surround and protect both the brain and spinal cord. We'll also be looking at the fluid-filled regions of the brain and the spinal cord. And then in 13.4, we'll be taking a look at nerves, uh, ganglia, and we'll introduce both the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. Below this presentation where this link is posted, you're going to find some additional resources to help you with the learning of the cranial nerve. So check those important resources out. So let's get started in 13.3. And again, we're looking at how the brain is perfused, how does it get its blood flow, as well as the layers and protective structures that protect the central nervous system. So let's start off with the blood supply to the brain. There are four main arteries that are going to carry blood uh, to from the heart up to the brain. First, there are the common carotid arteries. Uh, we'll see these um, quite a bit in the cardiovascular units when we look and name different arteries. Uh, you're probably familiar with carotid arteries. These are the arteries that travel up your neck. You oftentimes will take your pulse when you're exercising of the common carotid arteries. The common carotid arteries travel up the neck and then branch into the internal and the external carotid arteries. Again, we'll see these in greater detail um, as we move forward. In addition, um, there is the internal, uh, the carotid, and it's going to travel through, the, enter the cranium through the carotid canal. You learned about the carotid canal as one of the bone markings of the temporal bone. Okay, recall that was sort of a very perfectly round circle. It was in the temporal bone, an opening, and it's through that opening that the internal carotid artery, both left and right, enter uh, from the neck go up into the cranium right and are allowed to enter into the brain. The second set of vessels that supply the, the brain are the vertebral arteries. And you have seen the opening through which the vertebral arteries pass up through the vertebra. Remember that in the cervical vertebra, in the neck region, there are the transverse foramina of the cervical vertebra. And those openings on either side of the vertebra are the openings through which these vertebral arteries pass up. Um, the vertebral arteries actually enter the cranium through the foramen magnum. Again, another bone marking that you know, that's in the occipital bone, and then uh, travel up into the brain. And I'll show you where they travel here in a second. So if we take a look here, in this diagram, what we're seeing here are the vertebral arteries. You can imagine they're coming up through those transverse foramina of the cervical vertebra, and we'll see that those two uh, vertebral arteries are going to merge into the basilar artery, and the basilar artery is going to travel up through. Uh, there's that foramen magnum. It's going to come up through along the medulla, the pons, and we'll see how it also uh, goes into the deeper brain matter here in a moment. So definitely take a look at this video about the circle of Willis. Now, I am not going to have you learn all of these branches of the circle of Willis. Here is what I want you to know. So imagine here, what we're looking at is here are the vertebral arteries. So the vertebral arteries are coming up through the neck. They're gonna travel up through the foramen magnum they're going to merge into the basilar artery, right? At the base, think basilar, think base of the skull. And we can see that there's all sorts of arteries branching off from this basilar artery. In fact, some of them, look at the names, 
uh, go to the cerebellum. Some go to the pons, okay? So we see these names, pontine, think arteries going to the pons, the uh, cerebellar arteries, right, going off to the cerebellum. So the names look familiar, but don't worry about naming these particular structures. And then we see that there are the carotid arteries. And the carotid arteries came up from the common carotid arteries. And what we see is a very interesting arrangement called the Circle of Willis. This is simply named after the dude who described it. And what we see is something rather unique to most organs. Most organs in your body have one blood vessel that brings blood to it. For example, your kidney, your right kidney, has one renal artery that brings blood to it. If something happens to that artery, then the kidney will suffer or be completely and permanently damaged if the blood flow to the organ is disrupted. Or, for example, you have um, one major artery to, again, most of your organs. The brain, though, being so critical to your life, actually has four arteries, right, two to the left, two to the right, going up to the brain, and these arteries meet together to create this circle of Willis. And what this means, essentially, is that if there's blockage to one of these main arteries, there is other ways by which blood can get up into your brain. So it really is a protective mechanism to assure that there's minimal brain damage or loss when one of these major vessels is uh, potentially blocked off. I'm making it a little bit simple than it, simpler than it is, but again, this is the Circle of Willis. Uh, all you need to know are the four arteries traveling up into the brain, that is the carotids and the vertebral arteries. Now, once the blood has gone up into the brain, has provided oxygen and nutrients to the brain, and don't forget that we also have that blood-brain barrier that I introduced to you back in the previous chapter. Remember, the blood-brain barrier is uh, maintained by those astrocytes, and those cells help to reassure that the blood flow into the brain is more protected. Certain molecules are not able to pass that blood-brain barrier. But once that blood has entered into the brain, it's delivered oxygen, delivered nutrients, now that blood is going to come back from the brain through a series of veins. Again, a little bit different than other Sorry, places. I can't search by topic. In that, by there topic are a number of... And categories like thrillers or comedy. There are a number of veins that are going to return the blood back down out of the brain, break through the cranium, and come back down the vertebra. But before that blood pools into the veins, it is first going to gather in what is referred to as some sinuses. These are the dural sinuses um, collectively. And you see that there's a number of names, superior sagittal sinus, inferior sagittal sinus, straight sinus, transverse sinus, basically a series of blood filling regions and all this blood is then going to travel and eventually return back to the, the body through jugular veins, okay? And again, when we get to the arteries and veins, we'll look at a little bit more detailed at this, but not a lot. Um, at this point, just know that the arteries, the carotid arteries, the jugular arteries bring the blood up, the jugular veins bring the blood down. There are also vertebral veins that will do a similar work. Stroke is basically when the blood supply to the brain is disrupted. Now, strokes can happen in two different ways. One, there can be a, um, a bulging and a breaking of what's called an aneurysm of a blood vessel. So whenever a, an artery uh, bursts, uh, typically from high blood pressure, right? This is why high blood pressure is so, uh, what they call the silent killer, because a person will not have really any symptoms from their high blood pressure. But over time, that high blood pressure is causing the arteries throughout the body, and particularly to the precious brain, 
those blood vessels are being stressed, right? They're being stressed with too much pressure. Over time, that can cause the vessel to burst. So that is one common um, way or cause of a stroke. It's a sudden brain bleed, essentially. And as a result, uh, the blood flow is not being uh, sent to the correct part of the brain. We learned last time about how each part of the brain has different functions. So if a particular region of the brain is left without oxygen and without nutrients, brain tissue is very, very, very sensitive to a lack of oxygen and nutrients. So very quickly that tissue undergoes permanent damage. And recall we've discussed long ago that neurons, remember neurons don't have centrioles. So neurons do not have the ability to replace themselves. There are no stem cells that replace neurons. So once a neuron is lost, it is lost forever. So in addition to a, um, an aneurysm where the blood vessel bursts, there can also be a disruption of blood flow to the brain uh, from a blood clot. So those are the two big ones, right? Blood clots and aneurysms. The result is the same. The blockage of oxygen will cause the tissue that is not receiving the oxygen to die off very, very quickly. Here is just a, a diagram to have, help you understand that. So here is an embolism or a clot. This clot is going to prevent blood from traveling beyond this point, And that means that all the brain tissue beyond this point would be compromised. Definitely, I won't be testing you on it, but I think it's incredibly important that we all recognize the, 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 the symptoms of a stroke. So definitely, please take a look at this mnemonic fast. Uh, these are the signs that people will, will be exhibiting when they're having a stroke. Uh, changes in their facial muscles, changing changes in their um, ability to move their arms above their head, ability for their speech to change, and then of course time is of the essence if they're having issues with speech and things like this. So just take a look at this, uh, be familiar with FAST. Now the brain is an incredibly important organ clearly life does not go on without it so there are some important protective coverings that cover both the brain and the spinal cord these protective coverings are collectively called the meninges the meninges you probably heard of meningitis i'll mention that in a moment there are three very specific layers you'll see these in lab as well the outer layer is the dura mater recall you learned in the vocab that dura means hard. So this is a thick, fibrous, tough outer layer that protects both the brain and the spinal cord. It is anchored to the inner surface of the cranium and to the vertebral cavity. The middle layer, the middle uh, meningeal layer is the arachnoid mater. You might recognize this word, kind of looks like arachnid or a spider. And you'll see why it has this name in a moment. Uh, but there is sort of a filamentous uh, spider web sort of look to this layer, hence its name. And then on the inside, closest to the brain and spinal cord itself, is the thinnest, most delicate layer, and that is called the pia mater. Okay, the pia mater. Now, if you spell this backwards, P A D, right? So the the um, the meninges form a pad, if you will, right, uh, around the tissues, around the brain and spinal cord. Now, the pia mater, just to be clear, is very thin, and it follows every groove and uh, bump on the surface of the brain. So it's sort of like a shrink-wrapped layer right up against the gyri and the sulci. So let's take a look at this diagram of the meninges. And let me just get your orientation first. What we're looking at here, here is the longitudinal fissure. Remember, this is the deep groove between the left and right hemispheres. Uh, here is the bone, right, over the top. So this would be the parietal bone, for example. There's the suture, right, of the parietal bone. Deep to that, uh, we have the brain matter. Now, 
remember that the outer layer of the brain is referred to as the cortex. And this would be the cerebrum. So this is the cerebral cortex. And we see that it is darker in color. Recall why that is. The cortex in the brain is gray matter. Remember, gray matter is formed from cell bodies and dendrites. Uh, and more importantly, it's lacking myelin. It's lacking the axons that would be myelinated. Then when we look deep to the cortex, we see the medulla. And on the medullary region here, it is white matter because this is the area with the myelinated axons. Recall that the axons here would be myelinated by oligodendrocytes. So let's take a look. So shrink wrap right to the surface of the brain. I am kind of leading my pointer around and the layer that I'm pointing to is in fact the pia mater. So the pia mater is the shrink wrap layer. Notice how it follows down into all of the sulci, follows every groove and every impression on the surface of the brain. Then you see we're going PAD. We're going to go from deep to superficial. Then you see this spider webby layer. So the spider web, spider webby layer is in a fluid filled space referred to as the subarachnoid space. This space is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So in addition to these spider web looking fibers through here, this is a fluid filled region. This region is helping to protect the brain. Subarachnoid suggests that it's deep or under the arachnoid. So here the arachnoid mater is sort of the orangey color, okay, the, the deeper orangey color. That's the arachnoid mater. Again, from that layer you have the spider webby looking layers. And then finally, there's the dura mater. And the dura mater is this much thicker layer as shown here in gray. It's pointing to two parts of it, if you will. And notice that those veins, those blue vessels are collecting blood. And that's why those, all those sinuses, those blood filling sinuses were referred to as dural sinuses collectively. This is showing you one of those dural sinuses, the superior sagittal sinus. You know where this is. It's across the top of the skull, superior sagittal because it's in the sagittal plane sinus is a big space that in this case is collecting blood so that's a good introduction to the three layers keep in mind these three layers are found not only around the brain when they are brown around the brain they might be called the the, the uh, cranial meninges but these same three layers continue uh, down and surround the spinal cord as well there it might be referred to as a spinal meninges. So just a little bit of information about each of these. Again, read through this. The dura mater is the thicker outer cap. It's a very tough layer. When you are dissecting your sheep brain in lab, you may or may not see the dura. If the dura is present on your brain specimen, it'll be a rather tough whitish outer covering almost looks like just sort of a shell uh, around the brain it comes off rather easily uh, the name dura mater means tough mother right so mater means mother tough we know again dura means tough or hard okay now then there's the arachnoid mater again this layer has those fibery uh, structures coming down and we see those fibery structures in the subarachnoid space which again is filled with cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. CSF, recall, is made in part by those ependymal cells that I introduced, one of those glial cells. And then finally, the most delicate and most deep layer is the pia mater. It is continuous, um, creating this tender mother, right? This very, very gentle layer. And it's basically a very thin membrane that covers the entire brain. When we get down to the spinal cord, uh, I'll remind you of this, but at the end of the spinal cord, there's a thin filament uh, that is continuous with the pia mater called the phylum terminale. And we'll see that it goes all the way down and helps to anchor the spinal cord to the sacral and coccygeal regions. 
Now, if someone is suspected of having meningitis, and you've seen the commercials probably on TV, uh, it's kind of a depressing commercial, but it helps to report how serious this is. Meningitis is a very, very, very serious infection if it occurs. It is an infection of the meninges. It's an infection of the meningeal layers. If a bacteria, viral, or fungal infection gets into the meninges, it can cause swelling like all infections do. And what you need to realize about this is that the brain, and you'll see this when you do your dissection, the brain is very kind of spongy, right? It's not, it's a very spongy sort of organ. So imagine if the brain is getting squeezed by this inflammatory response of the meninges. Not only is the brain getting squeezed, but the blood vessels that travel to the brain are going to get severed. And that is how and why this is such a vital or, or horrible infection. And if one has meningitis, it must be diagnosed and treated immediately. So what they do is if you walk into an emergency room and you are having a massive headache, you have no history of migraines, you did not fall to create this headache, they will very likely do a, um, they're going to check for meningitis. This is especially true in younger people, college age and in younger. And they'll do this by doing a lumbar puncture. Basically, they'll go into the spinal cord region in the lumbar region. They will pull out the CSF fluid to see if in fact there is an infection. This fluid is traveling up and down through the meninges, um, up and down from the brain to the spinal cord. There is a, there's a pattern of, of circulation of this fluid. And so to take fluid from the lower area of the spinal cord is no different than taking fluid from the brain, but it's much, much easier and safer to get fluid from the spinal cord. They'll test that fluid for, here's a, an example of this, they'll go down into the lumbar region, they'll go into that very small blue area here. This is where the fluid is, the CSF fluid, and they retract that fluid. Um, it's a painful procedure, but necessary in order to assure that the patient is not having meningitis because, like I said, death can come very, very quickly if it is not treated and taken care of very quickly. So you can read about meningitis here. Again, the most common form of meningitis is bacterial. There are now vaccines to protect against the most common forms of meningitis. They're, they're relatively uh, effective, quite effective, uh, but there's still other forms of meningitis uh, against which the vaccines are not effective. In addition to the meninges that are protecting both the brain and the spinal cord, there's also quite a bit of cerebrospinal fluid circulating within the brain in open areas referred to as the ventricles. So the CSF is not only acting as a sort of a fluid protector, but it's also circulating, removing metabolic waste products and returning it to the bloodstream as well. <clears throat> so these ventricles, we'll name them in a minute. Uh, there are four of them found within the brain itself. And the, the fluid in the ventricles is continuous with the CSF that travels down into uh, the spinal cord, as well as the CSF that is circulating through the subarachnoid space. So all this fluid, right, in the ventricles, the subarachnoid space, and down the spinal cord is, is uh, moving around and circulating in predictable patterns. So there are four of these ventricles. Uh, they basically are coming from those hollow spaces that I barely introduced in the embryological development. So we won't worry about that, but just realize that there's a lot of spaces, right, that are formed by that tube-like structures of the early embryological nervous system. And um, let's take a look at those ventricles. You'll be seeing these in lab as well. The two largest are called the lateral ventricles. Man, this is easy. There's a left and a right lateral ventricle. There's nothing fancy here nothing fancy at all. Then the third ventricle, man, it's called the third ventricle. The great news about the ventricles, there's no fancy names. And the third ventricle is right around 
the um, diencephalon. Okay, so the third ventricle is in the space on either side of the diencephalon. Remember the diencephalon is the pit, the core, the center of the brain around the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And then uh, this fluid is all connected. All of these ventricles are connected through foramina and through what's called the cerebral aqueduct. And the cerebral aqueduct carries the CSF down to the fourth ventricle. Again, no fancy name, just the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is right between the cerebellum and the pons. Okay, so it's between the cerebellum and the pons in the upper medulla. So I'll show that to you in a moment. There's a nice little video here, just to, or not a video, a model for you to rotate and see these ventricles from a number of different views. In this first diagram, not to memorize this, but I want you to see these arrows. All it's showing you is that the CSF is circulating around in predictable patterns and that this fluid is not only going around that subarachnoid space around the brain, but it's also traveling around the cerebellum. It's also traveling down the uh, subarachnoid spaces surrounding the spinal cord and down the center of the spinal cord, there is what is called the central canal. I'll show this to you in a minute again, but there's the same fluid traveling down the center of the spinal cord. Let's take a look at these lateral ventricles. Hard to see. Uh, this is essentially a mid-sagittal cut through the brain. You can see the corpus callosum here. Imagine that behind this picture, there is a lateral ventricle. Imagine that in front of this picture, there's also another lateral ventricle. The artist is trying to show this in this shadowed area here. The third ventricle surrounds the diencephalon, right about where my pointer is going now, the third ventricle. Remember, this is the thalamus and this is the hypothalamus, so right in that area that is bathed by some fluid and then travel down that cerebral aqueduct here is this fourth ventricle. It is not, it's the smallest. <clears throat> and what you see is that it's right in between the pons and the upper medu uh, medulla oblongata and the cerebellum. So this widened area is the fourth ventricle and the fourth ventricle, again, is continuous with the fluid found in the CSF. Again, that um, cerebral spinal fluid is produced within the ventricles within a membrane called the choroid plexus and the ependymal cells that I introduced to you in the previous chapter are the cells that are helping to create and make that CSF. So that's gonna keep coming back to haunt you. So you might as well learn it now. Uh, again, this fluid is moving in a predictable pattern and uh, you are constantly filtering this CSF. About half a liter a day is being filtered. So again, uh, just an amazing process, right? Something you don't, even, you don't even think about, but you are filtering half a liter of the CSF every day, and that is to assure the, the overall health of your, car, of your uh, nervous system. So here are those uh, CSF circulation components. Again, you have the lateral ventricles found, this, found in the cerebrum, the third ventricle found around the diencephalon, the fourth ventricle found between the pons, the upper medulla, and the cerebellum. And there's also fluid in the central canal of the spinal cord and in the subarachnoid space, which surrounds both the spinal cord and the brain. So that brings us to the end of 13.3 you will be seeing and labeling these structures in lab and that'll be lab six and don't forget to check out these questions at the end as well as check out the uh, fill in the blank down here the vocab check okay let's check out 13.4 and here we're going to be looking not at the central nervous system which has been our focus up until this point but now we're taking a look at the peripheral nervous system recall these are the structures found outside of the brain or the spinal cord primarily we're going to be looking at nerves 
and we're also going to be taking a look at ganglia briefly. Uh, when we look at nerves, I'll be describing to you the 12 cranial nerves. I'll also be describing to you a number of spinal nerves, and you'll be learning all 12 cranial nerves, and you'll be learning a fair number of spinal nerves as well. You'll also be learning about the plexuses, that is the group of nerves that come off the spinal cord. A reminder that there is, in addition um, to just the PNS, there is a subset of the PNS called the enteric nervous system. I haven't talked a lot about it, but just know that it's a separate, it, it's really gaining notoriety and understanding. But within the, the stomach and the digestive system, there's essentially another entire nervous system that is largely independent of the CNS and controls all of your digestive functions. So let's first talk about nerves. A nerve is, and you need to know this definition, a nerve is a bundle of axons in the PNS. That's essentially the definition of a nerve, a bundle of axons in the PNS. Uh, remember back in muscle, you looked at the three layers of connective tissue that help to make up muscle, and there was the epimesium, the perimesium, and the endomesium. If you learned that and you understood that, this is going to look to be essentially the same exact thing, except now we're looking at connective tissue layers that are called the epineurium, the perineurium, and the endoneurium, and it's the same exact idea. Let's take a look at this picture for a moment. If I look at this, this is a nerve, okay? This is a nerve, and when I look into a nerve, what I see is that, remember it's a bundle of axons, but there are separate bundles. And these bundles of axons, right? These bundles of axons, this is the typo. These bundle of axons, um, so here's a bundle, here's an axon, here's an axon, here's an axon, here's an axon. These bundles of axons are uh, put together in what's called a fascicle, just like we saw in muscle, right? There was a, a group of muscle cells called a fascicle around which there was the perimesium. Here we have the perineurium. So let's zoom out and just kind of get a picture of this. So here is the whole nerve. The whole nerve is surrounded by the epineurium. Within the nerve, there are bundles of bundles of uh, axons. Those bundles are a fascicle. The fascicle is surrounded by the perineurium, and then inside, inside that fascicle, you see these are each. Let me make this a bit larger. These are each axons. And one thing I want you to know is that the axons are not all the same size. You see skinny axons, you see fat axons, and we'll see the significance of that later on, but uh, axons are not all the same diameter. Okay, and then if we look, right, we're looking at right here, this box is what we're seeing here. So now what we're seeing is that each of these is an axon, right? So let's get rid of that I, just an axon. If we take a look at the histology of this, this entire image is a nerve. If I look inside the nerve, I see a couple different fascicles. Now here's a monster fascicle. Here's a smaller fascicle. And I know from what I already know and what I've just been told is that it would be surrounded by a layer of connective tissue called the perineurium. So here's another fascicle. Here's another fascicle. In the epineurium would be the layer of connective tissue all around the entire nerve. Then if I were uh, to click into this image, I would see that this fascicle, there are individual neurons in here. And that's kind of hard to see at this magnification, but right here, you see right where I'm pointing right here? There, right there, there's an axon. And you see a white shadow around it. And you might be thinking, oh, that's the myelin. Yeah, absolutely. So that is an axon. The white around it is the myelin. Remember, we are in the peripheral nervous system. So that white 
myelin is being produced by Schwann cells that are surrounding that axon. And again, if we had a higher magnification, you would see that over and over and over within here, but that one kind of pops out at me even at this magnification. If we zoom in even closer, so here we go. We zoom in and we're now looking at, it tells us, right, this is the perineurium. So if this is the perineurium, we know that all of this, let me make this larger again, that all of this over here is a fascicle. So if we look into the fascicle, now at this magnification, man, you can really see this. Each of these white structures is an axon. Notice some of them are tiny, some of them are bigger, right? So we definitely see variations in sizes of these axons. And then around most of the axons, you can see a white layer, right? There's a white layer. That is the myelin. And then around that, there's another very delicate layer of connective tissue called the endoneurium. So it's exactly the same story we had with the, with the muscle, except we changed the terms from endomesium to endoneurium. Now, recall that from the very beginning of the introduction to the nervous system, I told you that the peripheral nervous system was composed of nerves and another term, ganglia. And I told you back then it wouldn't make sense. And in fact, it still may not make sense as to what I'm really referring to in the big picture. But let me define it to you once again. A ganglion, singular, is a group of neuron cell bodies in the periphery or in the PNS. Man, that's one of those definitions you just need to know, right? A ganglion or a ganglia are many. Ganglion um, is a group of neuron cell bodies or just cell bodies in the PNS. Okay, and we'll see later that ganglia can be either sensory ganglia or autonomic ganglia. We'll figure out what that means a little bit later on. The most common ganglion that we are going to see over and over and over and over and over is what is referred to as the dorsal root ganglion. This same structure is also called the posterior root ganglion. We're going to see that over and over and over. In a few minutes, you'll see it. Um, for now, though, remember that cell bodies, right? Cell bodies. Um, uh, a group of cell bodies is a ganglion. So right here, we're being told that this is a group, a bundle of cell bodies that makes it a ganglion, okay? So this is just simply telling you what it is. This is a group of cell bodies. It is a ganglion. We'll see where these ganglia are as we go forward. Um, and I will say one more thing just to say it and then we'll see it again. But these are cell bodies. These are sensory cell bodies. These are sensory neurons. Um, this is a sensory cell body. And if you could zoom in even closer, we would find satellite cells surrounding that cell body. Remember, satellite cells were one of the two glial cells in the PNS. And they are always found in the periphery of the sensory neuron cell body. Can't see it really there, but I just wanted to point out that that is where those cell, those uh, satellite cells would be found. And it's mentioned right here, right? Satellite cells will be found surrounding those neuronal cell bodies. If I zoom in, okay, here is a cell body, high, high, constant, uh, high, high magnification, and there are those satellite cells around the periphery of that cell body. Okay, so satellite cells and Schwann cells, the two S's, are the glial cells found within the P and S. Now, there's a number of different types of ganglia. I'm not going to really focus on this right now in this initial presentation, but we will see sympathetic chain ganglia later. We will see cranial nerve ganglia. We will see a number of different ganglia. We're also going to see paravertebral and prevertebral ganglia. The, the names kind of tell you where they're located, right? The paravertebral are next to the vertebra. 
Um, and uh, you'll, you'll see that these prefixes kind of help you determine where these different ganglia are. Another term that I, that I need to introduce to you is a plexus. A plexus is a network of, in this case, a network of nerves or a network of fibers. Now, in a broader way, a plexus can also be a network of blood vessels. And we'll see that use of this term later on. But for this unit, a plexus is going to be a network of fibers. Let me say here right now that in this unit, a fiber is an axon. Okay, and I think I said that in a previous presentation. But a fiber, a nerve fiber, Okay, in this, in this conversation, a nerve fiber is an axon. So let's say that again, a plexus is a network of axons, a network of nerve fibers. And we're going to see a number of plexuses, right? Plexuses, again, are groups of nerves, um, the, these uh, axons. And we're going to see the enteric plexus, right? This is the all the, the axons that go to the, to the intestines. We're going to see a gastric plexus that goes to the stomach and esophageal plexus that goes to, for example, the esophagus. We're gonna see a cardiac plexus and we're going to see a pulmonary plexus. So this is a term you're gonna see over and over and over. Just know it refers to all of the, the axons that travel to that particular region. Now, Let's get into what I think is a very, very cool and hugely important region or area of this content, and that is learning your cranial nerves. Coming off from the brain and the brain stem, there are 12 pairs of nerves. These are the cranial nerves because they come off the cranium. We're also going to see spinal nerves in a few minutes because they come off the spinal cord. All of the cranial nerves are responsible for sensory and motor functions in the head and neck region. Okay, And we'll see one of the nerves, the vagus nerve, travels down into the thoracic and abdominal cavities. And we'll see that as well but these cranial nerves oh how important they are and you're going to get to learn all of them now about the cranial nerves number one they are written always 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 using roman numerals so if you don't know your roman numerals now is the time to to, met, to learn them again okay roman numerals they're listed here one through twelve uh, you'll write CN1, CN2, CN3. Again, not using Arabic numbers, but always, always, always using Roman numerals. If they're written as Arabic numbers, I won't accept it. Okay, so make sure that in any work uh, that you always use the Roman numerals. So you'll see Roman numerals 1 through 12. And we'll learn here what these nerves do, what they control. What we'll discover in a moment is that some of these nerves are, quote, sensory nerves. That means that they only carry sensory information. Some of these cranial nerves are motor nerves. They only carry motor instructions, motor information. And some of these nerves are a combination of both or mixed nerve. So let's take a look at these nerves. Now there is a series of, there's a, there's a PowerPoint slide uh, that I'll share with you. There's also a how to learn the cranial nerves worksheet posted in the exam three folder. And the answers to that activity are also posted. Here is a mnemonic, very traditional mnemonic that will help you learn the cranial nerves. And here it goes. On old Olympus's towering tops, a Finn and German viewed some hops. Now, what is the significance of that mnemonic? The first letter of each of these words, O, 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 T, T. Those, that's the first letter of the name of the nerve. Okay, so we'll see that the first nerve 
is called the olfactory nerve. So we see O for olfactory. The second nerve is the optic nerve, another O. The third nerve is also an O, an ocular motor. Then we go to the trochlear nerve, to the abducens nerve, facial nerve, auditory nerve, um, the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve, the vagus nerve, and then we get down to the spinal accessory nerve, S, and finally to the hypoglossal nerve. So that's the significance of these. I give you a couple other of these mnemonics in my files, as well as a couple other mnemonics to help you with this exercise. If you take a look at the underside of the brain, except except for three of these, you don't need to recognize it coming off the base of the brain. Three of these nerves you're going to see again and again and again. You are going to see the olfactory nerve. It is these long, almost looks like antenna. They come out on the underside of the brain. And I've mentioned before that the nerve endings from the olfactory nerve travel down through the cribriform plate. Remember, you learned that bone marking in the ethmoid bone, and those little holes allow for the nerve endings to come down from the olfactory nerve into your nasal passages for you to smell. The second nerve that you'll see over and over and over is the optic nerve. You'll see it when you dissect your eye. It's the nerve that comes off the back of the eye. It's also the nerve that we saw crossed over at the optic chiasm. So we saw that way, way back in chapter uh, 12 in the introduction to the nervous system. You saw that the optic nerve came in and crossed over. You see this little crossing over structure here. That's a part of the optic nerve. And lastly, well, I'll never have you label it from this perspective. This little guy right here is the auditory nerve. Now I'm gonna use a different name for this nerve. I'm going to call the auditory nerve, I'm going to go ahead and write it here, the auditory nerve will be for us more commonly called and more, more uh, correctly called the vestibulocochlear nerve, right? Same thing, and that is cranial nerve number eight. And we'll see that this nerve, the old name is the auditory, the newer name more commonly, it's a vestibular cochlear because it has two important functions. And not only involves hearing, but it also involves the vestibular system and balance. This is the nerve that you're going to see come off the ear. So whenever we get to the ear sections of the course and you're learning the parts of the ear that'll also be in lab six, then you will see the eighth cranial nerve coming off from the ear. Other than that, you do not need to name or know the anatomic a location of these nerves coming off the bottom of the brain. Do note that they are largely in order as they appear coming off the brain. So sort of from front to back, you've got the 12 cranial nerves. Now in the, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to jump to a series of slides here uh, in a few minutes to better introduce these cranial nerves to you. But I'll tell you that these nerves are responsible for things like smell and vision. You have nerves, three of these 12 nerves control the movement of your eyes. In fact, you named the muscles around the eye. Remember you had the superior rectus and the inferior rectus, the lateral rectus, the uh, medial rectus, you had the superior oblique and the inferior oblique. You learned those six extra ocular eye muscles back in the muscle lab of the, of the um, axial region. Here, you're gonna be learning also which nerve controls those six muscles, but there's the ocular motor nerve. There's also the trochlear nerve, number four, and the abducens nerve, number six. So three, four, and six are all about moving the eye around. The trigeminal nerve we're gonna see is responsible for feeling on the face, but it also controls your muscles of mastication. For example, it controls your masseter. Uh, there are three parts of this nerve, the tri, right? Trigeminal, three parts of this nerve. 
and I'll show this to you in a moment in a picture, but there's the ophthalmic up by the eyes, there's the maxillary, the upper jaw, and there is the mandibular, the lower jaw branch of this nerve. There's the facial nerve, that's number seven, is gonna be responsible for the muscles making facial expression, think orbicularis oris, think your rhizorius, think all those muscles that you've learned around the face that aren't chewing muscles, but help to make funny faces. Uh, interestingly, the facial nerve is not only making funny faces, but it's also the nerve that is tasting or responsible for taste uh, and the front of your tongue, as well as saliva from your uh, front salivary glands. There's that vestibular cochlear nerve, right? Also called the auditory nerve, number eight. It's responsible for hearing and balance. The glossopharyngeal nerve is responsible for muscles of your throat. Um, think swallowing muscles. This, this nerve also goes to providing taste to the back of your tongue and to the production of saliva from your parotid glands, your more posterior uh, salivary glands. The vagus nerve is the one that travels down into your gut, into your thoracic and abdominal cavities and brings back sensory information from your stomach. Are you hungry? That signal's coming through your vagus nerve. Uh, the spinal nerve, uh, or called more often called the spinal accessory nerve. Uh, this one controls two muscles that you know well. Uh, I'll name them later on, but they're not listed here. But this muscle goes on to control the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid. And then finally, there's a hypoglossal nerve. As the name suggests, it's under the tongue and it's responsible for moving the muscles of your tongue, essentially. So some of these nerves are motor only. Some of these nerves are sensory only, and some of these nerves are both. And I'll walk you through those slides in a moment. So I'm gonna do that now, actually. I'm gonna to go to the bottom of this little section. I'm gonna show you this table, okay? And then I'm going to uh, show you these slides one by one. So again, in this table, uh, this is a, an area where spot, where uh, note cards might be suggested for you. Just get 12 more note cards and here's what you need to know. You need to know the number of the nerve. So this is number one. These are in order from one to 12. You need to know the name of the nerve. So number one is the olfactory nerve. What does it do? It is giving you your sense of smell. The S here tells you that it's a sensory only nerve. That's all this nerve does, it smells doesn't move anything and has no motor function. And finally, where do we find it, right? We find it in the olfactory epithelium, basically up in your nose. Number two, the optic nerve. You're gonna see this one coming off the back of the eye. Its job is to see things. It's your visual sensations. This is your ability to see colors, shadows, letters, numbers, right? Your vision, your sense of vision is controlled by number two. So I'm pointing out what I need you to know. You'll see it coming off the back of the eye called the retina. Number three, ocular motor. It tells you what it does. It moves motor, the oculo, the eye, and it does particular movements. And this is all of this is what I'm, what I'm saying to you is what you need to know. So the uh, ocular motor uh, nerve moves your eye up and down and medially. So this is your superior rectus, your inferior rectus, and if you're looking inward, that's your medial rectus muscle that has been contracted. It also allows you to look at the tip of your nose. So that is your, that is going to be your inferior rectus muscle. It also allows you to lift your eyelid and it constricts, it can, uh, constricts your pupil. So this, all of these movements, right? This is motor movement. So this is an M nerve. This is a motor nerve. Okay, so again, it's controlling your extraocular muscles, uh, uh, four of them, four of the six. Okay, four of the six muscles are being controlled by this nerve. Then number four is the trochlear nerve. 
The trochlear nerve also controls eye movement. This is down and out. This is controlling your superior oblique muscle of the eye. Again, it's a, mo it's a motor only nerve. I'm gonna jump down to number six, the abducens. It looks like the word abduct because this is the nerve that allows you to look outward. Lateral movements, lateral rectus muscle, motor only. So what three nerves control your eye movements? Three, four, and six. Back to number five, trigeminal, tri, three parts to it. This is the first nerve we've seen in the list that is both, it is both sensory and motor. Okay, I told you that this is the nerve that allows you to, um, this is the nerve that allows you to um, feel on your face. So that's the sensory portion. It's also the nerve that allows you to chew. So this is your muscles of mastication. Jumping down to number seven, the facial nerve. The facial nerve is also a mixed nerve. It moves the muscles of your face to make funny faces. It also is your taste sensations on your tongue. So it is both motor and sensory, it's both. Number eight, the auditory or what the lab book will call more the vestibular cochlear. That's the way I will also refer to it. Vestibular cochlear, because it has two parts, it's responsible for your vestibular system, your balance and your hearing from the cochlea, hence its name, but it only is sensory. It is sensing your balance and your hearing. Number nine, glossopharyngeal. Glosso, you know, means tongue. Pharynx is your throat. So this is the nerve that's controlling the tongue, the back of the tongue and the throat, sort of where they come together. So this is your, I always think this is your uh, nerve that controls your swallowing back in your back of your throat, your swallowing muscles, but it also controls your taste uh, sensory neurons in the back one third of your tongue. It also is responsible for some of your saliva from your parotid glands. That's the back, uh, the, the, the more posterior salivary glands. Number 10, vagus. Vagus means to wander. So this is the nerve that wanders all the way down into your gut and it is sensing your viscera, right? It's sensing your internal organs. It goes down to your heart. It goes down to your intestines. But it's also a motor nerve in that it controls your voice box. So if you can speak, right? If you can speak, you know that your vagus nerve is working. Number 11, spinal accessory nerve. This is a motor only nerve. It's moving your head and neck muscles specifically write this down. These head and neck muscles are your trapezius and your sternocleidomastoid. And then finally, number 12 is the hypoglossal nerve. It is a motor only nerve. It is allowing you to stick out and move your tongue, right? So muscles of your tongue. Uh, remember in lab, we learned about the genioglossus. Uh, so that muscle and your other tongue muscles are controlled by this nerve. So I am going to jump over to, make sure you do these activities as well here to help you learn your cranial nerves. I'm gonna jump over to those other slides now, kind of walk you through this one more time. So I'm gonna post these particular PowerPoint images just below this presentation. Again, it's just another way of looking at and learning the cranial nerves. What is on these slides is what you need to learn about each of these nerves, okay? So if we take a look, again, I told you, you don't need to worry about naming the nerves from an anatomical location from the base of the skull or the base of the brain. However, here's what you need to know. Cranial nerve number one, is the olfactory nerve. It is a sensory only nerve. It gives you your sense of smell. Okay, and interestingly, it's the only nerve that does not pass through the thalamus. Now I'm gonna show you an image here. Uh, this image is not meant for you to label, but just to give you a greater appreciation of the nerve. So we see the, the brain here. Here is those long antenna looking structures. This is what's called the olfactory bulb. This is the ethmoid bone. You can imagine those cribriform plate, those little openings, and those little openings allow for the passage of the nerve endings 
of the first nerve. This is the only nerve in your body that is directly exposed to the outside world, right? Because it comes down into the nasal mucosa and uh, it's the only nerve, right? That is truly available to the outside world. And so this nerve is easily attacked, if you will. And these cells are constantly regenerated um, as, as, as days go on. These cells have a high turnover rate. Number two, uh, this is number two, the optic nerve, sensory only. It's your sense of vision. We'll see it when we get to the eye parts. Uh, it's in the retina, the back layer of the eye. You've seen how it travels through the brain. Let's look at that again. Again, so here we have the optic nerve coming off the back. As I described to you back in the earlier chapter, it crosses over at the optic chiasm. Once it crosses over, this nerve then does a deep dive into the brain because it goes into the brain it's no longer the nerve it's now the optic tract and that information decussates remember it crosses over and we see that much of that information travels to the back of the brain recall that the occipital lobe contains the visual cortex right the primary visual cortex back in the occipital lobe Number three, the ocular motor it tells you what it does. It's moving the eye, but it, we need to know in what directions. It is moving the eye straight up and down and inward toward your nose and looking down at the tip of your nose as if you're going cross-eyed. So it is moving four of the six eye muscles. It's also responsible for pupil constriction and raising your upper eyelid. We see it here again, not to label these, but just to get a better understanding. Here's the third nerve coming in and it is going to innervate four of the six nerves. It's going to go to the superior rectus. It's going to go to the inferior rectus. It is going to go to the medial rectus and it also goes to the uh, inferior oblique. Okay, so those are the four muscles that it controls and it also goes to the levator uh, superioris, this is the muscle that helps to raise up your eyebrows and to the muscles that control the con const uh, constriction of your pupil. So we see it goes to the ciliary muscles behind the eye. That is all ocular motor number three. Number four, trochlear nerve. It only controls one tiny little nerve. Uh, the trochlear nerve controls the eye movement for you to look down. If you were in, in anatomic position, you have your palms down to your side, your palms are facing outward. If you can look down to your palm, kind of look down and out, that is the movement that the trochlear nerve controls and that is heading to the superior oblique. So that superior oblique muscles, remember that's the one that goes up through this little, cute little tendon structure, right? It goes up through that loop. That loop is called the trochlea the trochlea. We've seen the trochlea word before. Remember the trochlea is the distal end of your humerus. You can imagine a pulley kind of going through and around that trochlea. Just like here, you can imagine this sort of being like a pulley going up through a structure. So that is a very cool nerve that it controls that one little muscle of the eye movement, the superior oblique. Trigeminal, uh, three parts to it. Tri, uh, three sensory branches. Ophthalmic, top of the top of the forehead, top of the eye, maxillary, upper jaw, mandibular, lower jaw. In addition uh, to the sensory portions here, it also moves your muscles of mastication. So we take a look. Uh, it's a pretty good sized nerve. Again, it has an upward branch up in the forehead and the eye, a middle branch that goes to the upper jaw, and a downward branch that goes to the mandibular region. In addition. It's also going to the muscles of mastication, okay? Uh, so it's going to the muscles like your masseter. So it's a very interesting or very large nerve. Uh, this is the nerve uh, when you have dental work, right? That they're gonna numb up to help relieve the, the, uh, the, the feeling on your face, right? When you get uh, any kind of dental work done and they uh, sort of shoot you up with some Novocaine and different, uh, medications it is deadening oftentimes this nerve in different parts of it so you don't feel that jaw and facial pain here's a different picture to see those three branches of the trigeminal nerve again 
ophthalmic eye, maxillary, and mandibular. The abducens nerve number six, abduct. This is the last, this is the third of the eye movement nerves. It's going to go to the lateral rectus. It allows you to look to the outside, right? To look to abduct. So it goes to the lateral rectus muscle. The facial nerve number seven, uh, this one is also a really interesting nerve. It is going to be sensory in that it allows you to taste on the front two thirds of your tongue. It also makes saliva in your sublingual and submandibular glands, the front salivary glands. And it also allows you to move the muscles to make funny faces. So if you move your lips and your cheeks, the, those muscles are controlled by this nerve, the facial nerve. So I always remember it makes funny faces and spit and taste on the front two thirds of the tongue. You can see that here, right? It is going to um, all those muscles, right? Your orbicularis oris, orbicularis oculi. It's going up to your frontalis muscle. It's going to, you know, all the muscles, your zygomatic muscles that make you smile. All of those muscles are involved. You can also see that it's going to your salivary glands, right? And seven is specifically going to the salivary glands here in the front called your submandibular and your sublingual glands. Number eight, the auditory or the vestibular cochlear nerve. And again, you'll see it called a number of different things, but always to do with hearing and balance. This is a sensory only nerve. You'll see it whenever we look at the pictures of the ear. Here is a diagram of the ear and you'll see that nerve coming off the ear. It comes off in two parts. From the semicircular canals, we have the vestibular branch from the cochlea, it's the cochlear branch. These two branches combine to make the vestibular cochlear nerve number eight. Number nine, oops, number nine is the glossopharyngeal nerve. Again, um, glossotongue, pharynx, throat. This is your gag reflex. This is your swallowing muscles. This is also though the taste on the back one third of your tongue and saliva to the largest of your salivary glands, the parotid glands, which are also toward the posterior region of your oral cavity. So this big salivary gland here, the parotid gland, also taste to the back of your tongue and the muscles of swallowing and gagging. Number 10, the vagus nerve. It is the most complex, the longest, coolest nerve, I think, of all the cranial nerves. Uh, it travels down to your stomach, down to your gut, down to your heart, lungs, helps to monitor your internal visceral responses. So that is sensory, but it also is motor in if you can cough and you can speak your voice box, those are also uh, controlled by the vagus nerve. You see in this picture that it wanders down into the stomach, goes to the stomach, the upper intestines, to the lungs, the heart. Number 11, the accessory or the spinal accessory nerve, motor only, innervates the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. Again, we know these muscles, sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius, sort of the upper neck. And then finally, there is the hypoglossal nerve. It is a motor only nerve. It moves the tongue and you learned about uh, some of the tongue muscles in lab. It controls all of those tongue muscles that were listed in your lab materials. To remember the cranial nerves, again, there's that on Old Olympus's towering top, a finely vested German viewed a hawk or a number of these different mnemonics. And I have a worksheet for you. Um, again, posted, you'll see this as well. There are two or three of these mnemonics to help you learn the first letter of the cranial nerves. There's another set of mnemonics. For example, Sally sells mega monkeys, but my brother sells bigger, better mega monkeys. I know it sounds silly, right? But here's what this means. The first nerve is sensory. The second nerve is sensory. The third nerve is motor only. The fourth nerve is motor only. The fifth nerve is both. So we have sensory, sensory, motor, motor, both, motor, both, sensory, both, both, mega, uh, uh, motor, motor. So you can pick one of these phrases. Some say Marilyn Monroe, but my brother says Bridget Bardot, mm -hmm. or some ships make money, but my brother says big boats make more. You decide, small, small ship, sorry. So you decide which of these uh, mnemonics makes the most sense for you to memorize. I think they're really helpful for learning the cranial nerves. Again, under this 
set of slides, you're going to see some more information on tips and learning activities to learn the cranial nerves. The answers for those activities are also posted. Please take a close look at those things. Okay, so you'll be learning a lot more about those cranial nerves. That is one of those areas that will continue to be just heaped on top of you. So learning those cranial nerves now will make it so much easier as you move through the rest of your career. Uh, cranial nerves are vitally, vitally, vitally important. And you've all had your cranial nerves tested, but you probably weren't even aware that it was happening. So for example, when you go to the doctor's office and they say, okay, can you see my finger? Can you follow my finger in all directions? Can you stick out your tongue? Can you move your tongue? Can you say, ah, can you shrug your shoulders? All of those, what you've done in about five seconds is you have quickly assessed. Do you have equal and opposite reactions to most of the cranial nerves? The only, only cranial nerve that's not tested very, very quickly in those drive-by assessments is basically number one right, the olfactory nerve. But all of the other nerves, can you move your eye in all the directions, right? It's testing your three, four, and six. Can you stick out your tongue? That's 12. Can you shrug your shoulders? That's 11. Did you turn your head? That's also 11. Um, are you speaking? Did you say, ah, oh, that's number 10, right? Um, can you swallow normally? That's number nine. And then you're hearing my voice, so that's number eight. You walked in, you didn't seem to be off balance, so that's also number eight you felt maybe my finger go down across your face uh, that's number um, that's the the trigeminal so you can see very very quickly you can test all of the nerves except for number one so the rest of the nerves we're going to be learning about are the spinal nerves now the spinal nerves there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves uh, these 31 spinal nerves come off the spinal cord they're numbered very easily uh, remember there are 24 vertebra um, but there are 31 spinal nerves. So let's figure this out. There are seven cervical vertebra, but there are eight cervical nerves. This is a mismatch, right? It seems like a mismatch. These are numbered C1 through C8. There are 12 thoracic nerves, just like there are 12 thoracic vertebra. They are numbered T1 through T12. Here's the problem, guys. Um, if, you see the, if you see T1 in a conversation, uh, you need to look at the context. Are they referring to T1, the vertebra, with the same name, or are they referring to the nerve T1? Okay, so be always looking at context. T1 referring to the nerve or to the vertebra. There are five pairs of lumbar nerves, L1 to L5. There are five pairs of sacral nerves, S1 to S5. And there's one pair of coccygeal nerves, which are uh, oftentimes abbreviated CO1, CO1. These numbers are from superior down to inferior. And we'll see that these nerves come out from the spinal cord, pass through those intervertebral foramina that you learned about. And uh, where the mismatch happens is that the first nerve, C1, actually comes out from between the first cervical vertebra and the occipital bone. And then from there on, the second nerve comes out between uh, C1 and C2 and likewise all the way down, okay? Um, and uh, so that makes sense for the thoracic and lumbar nerves. Uh, each nerve emerges between the vertebra that has the same designation and the next one down in the column. The sacral nerves emerge to those sacral foramina that you learned about, the bone markings, those openings of the sacrum. As the nerves come off the spinal cord, I'll show you a picture in a moment, but we're going to see that there are four places where the nerves come off as a group, a cluster, a plexus, okay? Two of these are going to be up in the cervical level, one at the lumbar level, and one of these plexuses will be down at the sacral level, okay? I will expect you to know this information as well. The cervical plexus is composed of axons from spinal nerve C1 through C5. Okay, and these nerves are going to be very high in the neck. The one nerve, and again, this is all consistent with your lab materials, the one nerve that you need to learn from the cervical plexus is the phrenic nerve. Picture's coming in a moment. Okay, so the cervical plexus, C1 through C5, phrenic nerve, most important. 
Why is the phrenic nerve important? The phrenic nerve is the nerve that goes to the diaphragm, right? And without it, you cannot breathe. Then um, you have the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus is C4 through T1. Notice there is some overlap in this, and I'll make that a different color. And uh, the brachial plexus, these are the nerves heading over to the arm. And in lab, you will be learning these nerves, the radial nerve, the axillary nerve, the ulnar nerve, the median nerve, okay? Um, and there's one more, the musculocutaneous nerve. And you'll be learning those nerves. They all come, those five nerves come from this brachial plexus. Then there's a lumbar plexus. As the name suggests, it's down from the lumbar region. It is going to travel down the anterior leg. The most important nerve coming from this plexus is the femoral nerve. You'll also be seeing the uh, uh, obturator nerve coming from this plexus. And finally, there's the sacral plexus. It is going to travel down the posterior thigh. And the most significant nerve coming from this plexus is the sciatic nerve which you'll see in lab, goes on down the leg to branch into the tibial nerve and the fibular nerve. Or another way of saying it, really, the sciatic nerve is a combination of both of those nerves together. And I'll make that yet a different color. So we have the, the four different plexuses, four different colors. So let's take a look at this. And here uh, we've got the spinal cord coming down. And this group of nerves, C1 through C5, right, is the cervical plexus. And again, the most significant nerve coming from this region is the phrenic nerve. It's going to travel down and go to the diaphragm. Then you have the brachial plexus, and it is going to go down the arm. There are five nerves that come off from it, axillary, median, radial, ulnar, and, 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 let me go back to put this up here. But also you have the musculocutaneous nerve. Okay, and the reason I want to make sure I say this nerve is that the musculocutaneous nerve is the nerve you're going to be learning that controls the biceps brachii. So one of the nerves you're going to be asked to know, one of the nerve muscle combinations you're going to be asked to know is the musculocutaneous nerve that controls your biceps brachii. Then notice that there are no plexuses traveling off from the thoracic region. And the reason is these nerves come off the spinal cord and they are called the intercostal nerves. And these nerves, because they're already separated by the ribs, don't have the ability. So these nerves come off, they can't cluster together as a plexus because they are separated by the ribs. Remember the ribs come off from T1 through T12. Lumbar plexus, okay, we see it, and it travels, hard to see here, but it travels down the front of the thigh, okay, it fronts down the front of the thigh, and the two big nerves that come off the lumbar plexus, the femoral and the obturator nerves, and then the, the sacral plexus travels down the back of the thigh, and the most, common, the most popular nerve here that you'll need to learn is that the tibial nerve and the common fibular nerve merge together in what's called the sciatic nerve, when you get down to about the popliteal region, the back of the knee, the, the sciatic nerve then splits into or separates uh, between the tibial and the common fibular nerve. So that is the introduction to the spinal cord and to those spinal nerves. Um, I'll point out one more thing in this particular picture right here. Uh, the spinal cord itself comes down and ends at about L1. And you'll see this written in a number of places. You'll see this in lab as well. I'll go ahead and put it here though as well just for completeness. But where the spinal cord ends at L1, that is the conus medullaris. Okay. And I'll just put that there as a quick reminder. And in this diagram, see how this t comes down to a point right here. So that point is the conus medullaris and it represents where the spinal cord itself ends that's why when they're going to be going for fluid of the uh, cerebral spinal fluid when they're doing a lumbar tap they always come down in here because there's no spinal cord down in here the spinal cord proper ends at l1 at the conus 
and everything down below that is what's referred to as the cauda equina and that is not the spinal cord itself. So if a needle goes into the, erect, the subarachnoid space here, it is not going to cause damage to the spinal cord because it isn't here. It stops at L1. So with all that, let me go ahead and turn off today's presentation. Uh, again, don't forget to go down, check out the questions down here at the bottom of this. Um, here, it looks like you need to learn the 12 nerves. No, that you don't, just name them. So the one through 12, name them uh, based upon this diagram. And then the second one is having you learn the function. So this is the function of those nerves. Again, don't worry about labeling them from this, but just know the numbers and their functions.